Just let me try it. Um, gonna get to run. How long did you think that it was going to originally take? Uh, not too long. I had to take the starter out, like, two or three times. So, I didn't think it was gonna, like, be a short process. We were at a swap meet and just picking up old parts and things like that for some of his cars and some of my more recent versions. And uh, a guy had one for sale on the last day, and I just started haggling with him. And I didn't really want one, never even drove one, never even owned one, and ended up leaving with one. And, and uh, it kind of took off from there. There's an, old, uh, there's an old joke among Model T restorers. Um, typically, the, the guys that are interested in these say, I'd really like to have like one or two good running Model T's that I can use on a regular basis and now I'm down to seven so far so it's, it's kind of like they're kind of addictive and so once you get one then you tend to run into more of them and and so right now between my brother and I we have five and uh, um, he's restoring a, a very early a 1919 model right now and uh, um, he did a lot of the work and helped me get this one up into where it would roll and everything and then basically got it running this summer and real real superficially and then we caught it we brought it here and then of course the guys I wanted them to kind of see how the the advent of the automobile actually started they're so very crude and, and very agricultural and so uh, I wanted them to see that the number one selling vehicle in the world for the past 25 years has been the Ford F-150 pickup and I want them to see the, the where it originated is this, this truck right here so that was kind of the basis of us kind of getting interested in these. I have like several old Ford pickups and it's just kind of been a thing that I've started kind of collecting them so that one the best we can tell is a 1925 there's some 24 parts on it um, it's hard to tell over the course of 90 years you, you things get exchanged and rearranged and modified and that kind of thing so it's um, it, you have to kind of go with the you know the predominant number of parts that are on it and, and trace some serial numbers so the, the frames themselves were not numbered and so <clears throat> there's no way to really trace the history of that particular complete vehicle we can only go by an engine number and that could have been exchanged, you know, 10 or 15 times over the course of that. So as best we can tell, like I say, it, it has all of the pieces of a 19, late 1924-25 car. You would think that a car that is almost 100 years old, uh, parts would be hard to find. Actually, you can buy practically every brand new part for that car somewhere in the world because they sold so many and because it's such a, a historical vehicle that um, there's people that specialize just in every new component for that car. You could build one of those <clears throat> if you had a frame, which are very easy to find by the way, uh, frames themselves. Now the rest of it gets harder, but uh, you could build a brand new vehicle. It cost about $30,000 to do it, but you could build a brand new vehicle out of parts that are available for them, largely. Because they're so different than the things that they've learned about, uh, everything is, is, has to be retaught basically because there's no electronics that control different systems of the car. There's no um, hydraulics or, or, I mean, everything is just kind of start from scratch. And it's closer to a lawnmower than it is uh, a car by today's standards. And uh, just because of the simplicity of it and the way that it functions. Um, so it's, it's, it's harder for them to kind of grasp a lot of the, um, the systems on that vehicle because it is radically different than anything we drive currently. If something uh, fails on that vehicle, it's much easier to fix because you, they were designed to be repaired and, and maintained by people who had no experience mechanically at all. And remember, that car came about in a time period when there were no roads, there were no paved roads. The closest thing you came to paved roads were brick streets that larger cities had, and outside of that, you get out, out of town, there were no paved, paved roads at all. And most people lived in rural communities that, that owned those types of cars. And so 
they had to be able to service it themselves. So that, therefore, it's very simple if you understand the real theory behind the way these kind of vehicles work. On this car, if I was to drive it to Wichita, it would re require me to plan carefully for tire failures and things like that because that is just a routine that whenever you go more than 50 miles, there's a distinct possibility that you're going to run into some sort of mechanical problem that you have to be prepared to solve. Uh, you obviously don't find parts just by stopping into a local dealership. And so everything requires a little bit of thought. <clears throat> and much like the time period in which it was new, to drive from here to downtown Wichita would have been an all-day event. That, and probably even you would spend the night and come back the next day. And so we don't think in those terms, especially with, you know, the you, know, you can go to Wichita and be back before, you know, lunch. That just wasn't the case when this car came about. So you have to be rather handy. You have to be able to make adjustments and things like that along the way that you would not make on a, on a modern car. Do you want to kind of talk us through like what you did to restore the vehicle? You took every nut and bolt apart. <laughs> Literally it's been, the frame has been changed out, the, the engine has been completely gone through. Now my students didn't do the engine on this car. Um, uh, my brother did a lot of it with, with me and we, we worked together on that during the summer and uh, even last summer, we, we worked it over some, and so it's been a process of about two years getting this to this position. And so um, the students were, were able to assemble, disassemble, repaint, and, and kind of reconfigure this car to a large extent. But the um, uh, primary, the deep mechanical work was, was done by my brother and myself. Every part on that car has been all over the garage, though. There's been a, not a single nut or bolt was left uh, in its place originally. It's been completely taken apart. And so either myself or my brother, my brother to a large extent, assisted me with you know, getting it all together. No one person can do this. But uh, it's interesting. Go on to a website. There's plenty of them out there where you can see um, the Model T assembly record. Uh, I think they can completely assemble a Model T in less than 15 minutes from an assembled engine and final drive. Now that's not every single part, but they assemble, put all the wheels, build the frame up, uh, put the radiator in it, oil, engine mounted and all that kind of stuff and, and they can do it in like 15 minutes. Some of the teams do it. It's kind of interesting to watch.